Well, welcome everybody to today's moderated panel session on melanoma and cancer survivorship. My name is Sapna Patel. I'm a medical oncologist, associate professor, director of the uveal melanoma program, and fellowship program director for the Department of Melanoma Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer survivorship is really multifactorial, multidimensional. It's personal for every patient and caretaker, and it really starts at the time of a cancer diagnosis. It involves living with, through, and beyond cancer. Let me say that one more time. Cancer survivorship involves living with, through, and beyond cancer. We often think of this survivorship in three phases. There is the acute phase, which really comprises the time from diagnosis until the end of treatment. And there's an extended phase that, that involves surveillance, surveillance and any act aftercare for treatment side effects. And then we think of permanent survivorship often when cancer is in the rearview mirror. Survivorship encompasses a number of emotions. I hope you're seeing the slide um, on the screen. You know, there's a lot of fear, anxiety, maybe there's some guilt, doubt, uh, hesitation, insecurity, but ultimately hopefully also some relief and pride with the cancer survivorship. There are a number of resources online and I would encourage you to look at the ASCOcancer.net survivorship site as well as the NCCN survivorship guidebooks. And for our rare melanoma patients, the audience members who are caretakers for rare melanomas, this diagnosis and survivorship often feels very isolating. But there are a couple of versioning resources for you to, to look at. The MRA has the rare registry for our acral and mucosal melanoma patients. And the Melanoma Research Foundation has generated a patient registry for this uveal melanoma population. We ask, we ask that you participate in today's session by, by putting your questions in the online web conference system. I know we've had some AV challenges, but we'll get through it today. I ask that you refrain from asking any personal medical questions, um, but we are happy to field your, your comments and concerns. We have a wonderful panel of experts and empaths joining us today. I'll give a very brief introduction, and then we'll ask each panelist to, to give, give us some more uh, information on their background and perspective. Joining us is Dr. Bettina Yanez, an associate professor in the Department of Medical Social Sciences at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. A clinical psychologist by training, Dr. Yanez's research is in the areas of patient-centered outcomes and psychosocial issues uh, pertinent to cancer control and survivorship. Dr. Yanez is the recipient of a 2018 MRA American Cancer Society Pilot Award investigating a web-based immune-related adverse events reporting platform. Dr. Lorenzo Cohen is the Richard E. Haynes Distinguished Professor of Clinical Cancer Prevention and the Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Cohen is also leading a 2018 MRA Teen Science Award investigating the role of diet, mental health, and the microbiome in response to immunotherapy. And Mr. Keith Tolley is a father of four young children and 15 grandchildren. As a stage four melanoma patient, Keith has really uh, gone through it all, surgeries, radiation. He's participated in a phase one clinical trial. He's been treated with both single agent and combination immune checkpoint blockade. And he serves as a consumer reviewer for the Department of Defense study sections. He also is actively engaged in patient care, patient advocacy, and mentorship. So Dr. Yanez, would you mind giving us a few minutes of your time delving into more of your background? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have been invited by the MRA to talk a little bit about my research and, of course, to field questions uh, from patients and caregivers. So my research bridges behavioral medicine and health equity um, to really look at 
ways to improve patient reported outcomes and clinical outcomes among individuals diagnosed with cancer so that we can translate really evidence-based research into cancer care. To address the concerns faced by many cancer patients, I've established an impactful and innovative research program fo focused on patient-centered care by engaging key stakeholders to address major public health problems facing cancer patients, optimize cancer-related outcomes, and enhance cancer care delivery. My research is organized into three distinct but overlapping components, including health equity and community-engaged research, evidence-based behavioral oncology research, and implementation of patient engagement and patient-reported outcomes in cancer care. Specific to melanoma research, I do have a funded research project by the MRA in conjunction with the American Cancer Society to investigate how we can improve patient provider communication regarding adverse events for patients who have initiated immune checkpoint therapies. And we do this, we've developed a platform that's online to help patients um, report any side effects or adverse events that they might be experiencing once they've initiated checkpoint inhibitors to their oncologists on a regular basis in case there's any concerns about any adverse events or side effects with the goal being to facilitate communication um, related to adverse events and hoping that this will improve clinical outcomes down the road, but also improve the quality of life among patients who are taking checkpoint inhibitors. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know we have other panelists here. No, that's great. Congratulations on your work, Dr. Yanez. Dr. Cohen, please go ahead. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had uh, a few slides to share, but now the slide share screen option has disappeared. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Um, so I wanted to share a few slides because although, as you heard in the introduction, um, I am a faculty member at MD Anderson, um, I also have, have moved on to the other side of the exam table, so to speak. And just a, a quick uh, story about um, how this all came about. I've been at MD Anderson now for almost 24 years. And back in 2018, had finished writing this book that you see pictured there called Anti-Cancer Living. I'm a behavioral scientist by training, particularly in the area of of lifestyle and psychosocial interventions, things like yoga, meditation, and also acupuncture, diet, exercise, um, and, and what we call in, in this book, uh, the mix of six. And in March of 2018, when we signed off on the book, literally the last uh, copy of the book, and that same day, I had a biopsy of a, a lymph node that had been growing uh, under my left axilla, and it actually came back as malignant. And at that point, there was no information on the exact result. Uh, Coincidentally, I received an email that same day from Michael Kaplan from the MRA saying that our MRA grant was funded to study lifestyle and melanoma. Lo and behold, a couple days later, the diagnosis came back that I had stage three melanoma. Um, so this was, uh, you know, the irony was not lost on me on, you know, the day I get an MRA grant, the day that I sign off on the co final copy of this book on lifestyle and cancer prevention. Um, but what we can get into, time permitting, and, and if there's the interest, is what we call the mix of six, the six lifestyle factors that we know are are critically important for cancer prevention, first and foremost, but also to help control disease once one has it. You see there at the top, and most importantly, love and support, stress, stress management, sleep and healthy sleep hygiene, appropriate exercise, diet, and decreasing environmental exposures. Of course, you know, the environmental exposure that led to my diagnosis was probably the uh, excessive number of sunburns under the age of 20, which, of course, we know increases your risk of melanoma. Most importantly, something that's not talked about in this area of lifestyle is, 
ensuring that there is synergy between these components. An important thing to consider is when we're talking about something like stress management or diet or exercise, it's not just about feeling better. These six lifestyle factors influence one, if not many, of what we call these cancer hallmarks, the biological processes that need to be activated, so to speak, to allow that mutated cell in your body to grow and proliferate. And of course, we want to create a an environment that is as inhospitable to cancer as possible um, by deactivating uh, these processes. There's literally processes in the tumor microenvironment, of course, that conventional medicine and pharmacology are trying to, um, to have an impact on, such as increasing immune function, decreasing angiogenesis, uh, decreasing some uh, gene signaling pathways. And again, aspects of our lifestyle are going to influence these. And we can get into more details if there's questions around the microbiome, but the microbiome now, and in particular, the most recent uh, scientific meeting, the American, American Association, Association of Cancer Research, Research that, that just happened earlier this, this week, week. Overwhelming data showing that our microbiome, the bugs, the bacteria that live primarily in uh, our gut, but also uh, in the tumor microenvironment, are going to influence the efficacy of treatment. And data that's come from Dr. Wargo's laboratory and more recently from the research we are doing with the MRA funding, looking at, at diet and exercise and other lifestyle factors, it's clear that a high-fiber diet increases the beneficial effects of immunotherapy. I describe my own little experience around the microbiome and shifting of my own diet from diagnosis, and if there's questions, uh, we can get into that in more detail. And just to close out, um, in terms of the mix of six, it's critically important to harness your team to allow you to be successful in modifying your life and again making our body as inhospitable to cancer as possible critically important we can get into some of the details of this that that we need to manage our stress because stress really does make our the tumor microenvironment more hospitable to cancer growth the sweet spot for sleep is between seven to nine hours we need to exercise more on a regular uh, basis, um, as well as, as just standing up and, and sitting less. Um, we can get in what this means, the 90-10 rule, but you really want to be eating foods that we know are nourishing, that are healthy for us, and decrease the foods that are not. It's not deprivation per se, but just have them be a smaller portion of what's on your plate. And then decreasing environmental exposures and, of course, protecting ourselves from uh, the radiation from the sun. And at the end of the day, this is hard, but it's, it's a practice. And the more that you practice, the better we will all get. Um, and with that, I will hand it back. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. I think... Um, is really these are factors that are under our control. And when everything feels like it's swirling out of control with the cancer diagnosis, these are really important factors to consider. Mr. Tolley, would you like to give us some more of your background? Sure. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much for, for having me. me. Um, the, uh, let me just, just make, make sure that, that I'm, can, can you hear me? me? Good. Yeah. yeah. Sounds, Sounds great. great. Okay, okay, great. great. Um, I, I thought, thought um, I, I would just, just unpack a little bit about my story and uh, fill in some of the details that you highlighted. My story uh, starts really with this uh, small little pinkish spot that was on my left thigh that was misdiagnosed originally as some kind of serratic uh, plaque. And uh, I was told, don't worry about it. Uh, you should be okay. We'll just keep monitoring that. Well, about three years of monitoring later, what was interesting is um, I had a new care provider come in, and she took one look at it and said, "Huh, we need to uh, we need to do a biopsy on that." And uh, the biopsy result came back; it was melanoma, and uh, which totally shocked my wife and I because we had told, been told all along, at least we had been led to believe that it was 
uh, nothing to be worried about. And that, that really began my uh, journey, my melanoma patient journey. And as you had mentioned earlier, Dr. Patel, over the next um, probably two years or so, my melanoma uh, spread um, uh, to quite a, quite a different, different parts of my body. I had to go from my thigh to my lymph nodes, to my liver, to my lungs, to my bones, uh, and to different soft tissue areas of my body. And to combat the spread, I had uh, had to have, as was mentioned earlier, multiple surgeries. I participated in a clinical uh, phase one clinical trial uh, that featured a combination of a personal cancer vaccine and a PD-L1 inhibitor. And that was a great experience. Um, I'm a huge proponent of clinical trials. I then had uh, three infusions of ipilimumab and nivolumab, and these were incredibly helpful for me uh, in terms of helping to stop the spread of the disease, but it came with a cost, and uh, the cost was experiencing multiple and significant adverse side effects, which I think we might be talking about um, on our panel today. And then I had a series of radiation therapy treatments on uh, disease spread in my shoulder and then 27 infusions of nivolumab, which I just completed uh, less than a year ago, July 2020. And since then, I've been doing um, my best to try to navigate the uncharted waters of being post-treatment. And it's an adjustment that's been a little different than I thought it would be. And I'm still uh, getting quarterly scans and uh, lab work um, at the uh, site, the uh, hospital that I've been uh, experiencing treatment with. So I guess just to summarize, over the course of the three years, um, I kind of know what it's like to be dis misdiagnosed. I know what it's like to have to deal with rapid disease spread that um, seem to be out of control. And uh, I know what it's like to have had multiple surgeries, to participate in a clinical trial, to have radiation therapy, uh, and to do both combination drug and single drug immunotherapy, and um, also to experience uh, a number of side effects from those treatments, one of which is um, uh, has caused me to be on steroids now, which will probably last for the rest of my life. And on top of that, the good news is I'm learning to live in a post-treatment uh, world, which I'm praying will continue indefinitely. And um, I've had the privilege of being uh, actively engaged in patient advocacy work and uh, patient mentoring of patients at all different stages of melanoma. So that's kind of my story. And that's bring you up to date with what's going on. And yeah, I do have 15 grandchildren, 14 and one in the in the womb about ready to be born. So very exciting for us. That's great. Congratulations. Actually, uh, I think you're transitioning beautifully into our audience questions. You know, as a cancer survivor from the beginning, from the initial uh, start of your diagnosis. I'd like you to maybe give us your perspective, and then I'd like to hear from Dr. Cohen on uh, modifications for our stress. How do you deal with the anxiety that comes, maybe not so much waiting for a biopsy at this point, but every time you have to come in for scans and then wait to hear results? How do you manage that? Yeah, um, initially I managed it pretty poorly because it was all pretty, um, you know, a little frightening uh, at the beginning. Um, and and what, I, what I had realized was uh, much of my fear was coming from the fact um, uh, it was really being driven by the unknown, uh, the unknown at the time of my fear. So um, I, I have really had no idea what was going on in my body, though I was reading about things and hearing things that um, might uh, might be happening. And, you know, I didn't know if um, my body uh, disease was spreading. I didn't know if the treatment was working or not working. You know, I didn't know um, what was the next steps. 
So leading up to scans, which can be, you know, even on this side of treatment is still uh, a little unnerving. I, I have found for myself, much of it uh, comes from not having clarity about what the results will be or what is going on in my body. So what I realize is there's some things I can control, and, and I'm really looking forward to Dr. Cohen sharing from his experience. There are some things I can control, and there's some things I can't control about leading up to scans, and then once the scans are taking, taken and waiting for the results of the scans. And so trying to focus on the present, what I do know, and what I can control along with some of the things that Dr. Cohen lists in his, you know, exercising on the way to scans, um, you know, the days leading up to, I make sure that I'm um, active. I make sure that I'm connected to my support group. Um, I make sure that I'm getting sleep as best as you can, waiting for scans and waiting for results and uh, wait, wait, watching and being very mindful of the, um, what I'm eating, and, um, you know, things like that. So uh, another piece to it, though, that, that wasn't on his list that I would just add and would love to hear uh, others comment to is the role of spirituality in the kind of the survivorship journey and process. And that's been very important to me, and it's been very helpful in managing stress. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Cohen, I'd love to hear your take on uh, modifiable or controllable anxiety factors leading up to scans and clinic visits. Yeah, so so the, 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 this is a real issue, and you know, colloquially we call this scan anxiety, uh, which of course is the anxiety in in you know leading up to, and then during the actual experience of getting scans, and then and then that waiting period. And my philosophy has always been, you know, like like Keith said, where he has evolved to is, you know, this is something that we can't control. And if, if we looked at Eastern uh, philosophies of being in the moment in the present is is the key to avoiding a lot of anxiety in life about absolutely everything. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan. And one, one of the unique things about about human beings over over other animals is uh, the the ability to have metacognition and the ability to to think about things that haven't happened yet. Now that is in some sense adaptive um, because you plan, but planning for the worst and being worried about the worst, you're actually living that experience, and the, your physiological response to an actual diagnosis is not that different than the imagined worst case scenario. So when you take yourself there and thinking about, well, what if it has come back? What if, et cetera, all the what ifs that, that human beings live in, uh, you are actually responding to that at, at a biological level. Um, and that is not good for us. At the same time, you don't want to ignore the real fears and concerns. But I, I think the best philosophy is, you know, if something negative comes out of a future scan, and my scans are coming up in June, um, I'll deal with it then. But until then, I'm not going to worry about it because there's nothing to do. There's, the worrying doesn't help. So, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, if there's something to do, then do it. But if there's nothing that, that you can do, uh, then, you know, the worry is only going to be harmful. And as Keith said, you know, double down on what we call the mix of six, you know, you know, up your healthy foods, your exercise, making sure that, that you're taking breaks from work. And, and for sure, spirituality is, is super important. And, and for us, it, it kind of could fall under multiple categories. But, you know, the support category, which is, of course, support from uh, your, your spirituality and beliefs, as well as prayer being a, a very effective form of stress management. Yeah. Could, Could I just, just add, add one thing, thing too that 
triggered from base from what uh, Dr. Cohen was saying. Um, I think what's been helpful for me too is to talk through my fears uh, with someone else who's on my support team. Usually it's my wife or my kids. Um, there's just something about being able to name the fear, talk about it, talk about you know your anxieties and your worries and get input from others to kind of help level set and bring reality back into any vain imaginations that I've let run away to dark places. So I, just, I think there's, there's wisdom and help uh, for us as patients on the way to the scans and in between the scans and the findings to just be honest and talk with our group, our support team about what we're going through. And I have found that's been very helpful. Yeah, you know, I, I will say as a provider on the provider end of this, we carry that anxiety with our every patient. We're worried for you too. But um, we can't expend that worry before it's due. So very much aligned with what you're saying is you focus on the present. And then you, uh, if you plan for a bad news, if you play the what if game, and patients ask this all the time, what if this, what if that? If you play that, it makes the, the hard news or the tragedy or the event that you have to endure no less tragic, no less difficult to endure down the road. And what you've done is spent the hours in the, the sands in the hourglass now on that emotion when there are plenty of things to, to feel positive or grateful for. I think this um, you know, transitions nicely over to Dr. Yanez. Maybe you can help us understand the role of supportive oncology and our support system in this cancer survivorship journey. Yes, absolutely. I get this question a lot. Uh, what, what is supportive oncology? How do, how do I get to supportive oncology? Who is part of supportive oncology? Most cancer centers have a program or department of supportive oncology, and each cancer center is kind of is going to define it a little bit differently. But usually, it's a multidisciplinary team that's dedicated to listening and responding to patient concerns, promoting well-being, and treating each individual with respect and compassion. Uh, some hospitals will encompass palliative care as part of their supportive oncology team, and palliative care can really help with symptom management, adverse events, pain is, is a big area that palliative care specializes in. Sometimes patients have asked me in the past, well, isn't that only for patients, you know, with, with metastatic disease? Um, am I a good candidate for palliative care? And I remind them that I think most patients can probably benefit from palliative care at some point, especially if they're feeling uncomfortable, if they're feeling side effects or adverse events. You can ask your main oncologist for a referral to palliative care because really their goal is promoting health-related quality of life and symptom management, which a lot of patients at some point who've gone through treatment will experience some degree of, of symptoms or side effects. Also part of supportive care, at least here at Northwestern, we, within our supportive care program, we also have a team of psychologists, licensed clinical psychologists who focus and whose really whole um, training is in supportive oncology and the behavioral aspects of working with patients with cancer. We have licensed clinical social workers. We have a psychiatrist on board too who really um, has a good sense of understanding of different types of interactions with chemotherapies and different medications as well. So it's, it takes the whole approach to promote well-being and I think for patients, we were talking about anxiety, and we, we started talking about you know anxiety and fear in the context of, of scanning, the scan scan anxiety. I think as Dr. Cohen referenced, um, and that's a, that's a, a time when we see a lot of anxiety with patients um, as they're waiting for um, imaging results or biopsies. But when we see, and that's that's typical, but when we see elevated levels of anxiety that kind of persist beyond just that's you know waiting for results and kind of are a part of the patient's life where it's interrupting daily activities, their ability to socialize, their ability to sleep, appetite, it's really becoming something that they can't let go of and it's a pervasive thought. There's different strategies that we can try to manage that anxiety. We do tend to see elevated levels of anxiety and distress among individuals who are going through treatment and even cancer survivors. And working with a social worker or a psychiatrist or a psychologist through evidence-based programs like cognitive behavioral therapy can be very helpful for patients in treatment and even 
post-treatment and during the survivorship phase. Thank you. I'd like to ask an audience question and, and maybe we can pass this around to everybody. I'll start with Dr. Yanez and then Mr. Tolley, I'd like to hear your, um, your perspective and then Dr. Cohen. When, when, a, when a survivor is experiencing side effects, either acutely related to treatment or in the post-treatment phase, what is the utility of say an online reporting platform or directly communicating that keeping a log or just holding that until your next clinic appointment. And, and I'd like to hear from Mr. Mr. Tolly, maybe what happened when you were experiencing some of these, were you feeling sort of stoic as if maybe I shouldn't report these, I shouldn't tell the team every little thing that I'm registering. And then of course, Dr. Cohen, what is it we can do from a maybe mix of six standpoint to combat some of our treatment related side effects? So maybe Dr. Yanez, you can talk to us about reporting these and the benefit of perhaps reporting in a timely fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's important to educate patients, start off with educating our patients, especially who are starting um, targeted therapies or checkpoint inhibitors, that maybe the side effects and adverse events that patients who are taking these types of uh, treatments are not always the same as patients who are going through chemotherapy. So sometimes will patients will say, well, I had a, you know, a sibling, my significant other went through chemo for breast cancer. I understand that they had nausea and vomiting and hair loss. I'm expecting that. But when it comes to immunotherapy, the side effects and adverse events can be quite different. Um, and what I always, you know, what we always tell our patients here, and the, one of the reasons we developed an online reporting platform was because we were concerned that maybe patients weren't reporting some of their side effects as quickly as possible. We had heard stories that patients were waiting until their next appointment a few weeks down the road to disclose a rash that you know was bothering them and getting worse. And when it comes to immunotherapy, you want to report the side effects as soon as possible. So we developed an online reporting system that administers a, a checklist of adverse events and side effects to patients on a regular basis in between their medical oncology visits. And when patients report an adverse event that's kind of let's say severe to very severe, we alert their clinician within a few hours about this side effect so that their clinician can become aware and reach out to them. We also let patients know, uh, you know, what are the most important adverse events and side effects when you should be, you know, contacting your oncologist right away. So I think it's important to keep in mind that if you catch an adverse event or side effect sooner rather than later, it could help with the management of that before it escalates. It can not only improve the quality of life of the patient, but it could also lead to better management approaches too. And certainly in the breast cancer world, this early reporting actually improves outcomes. You know, yeah, so, so I, I think, think we want to latch on to this in the melanoma survivorship world as well. Mr. Tolley, was there any hesitation from you reporting side effects? Would you have used an online platform such as the one Dr. Giannis is describing? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it answers your, your question. question. Yes, and yes. yes. Um, and, and I just want to say that you know, early on, when when you found out that your disease has spread, or they're talking about treatment, um, as a patient, the the thought is not, "Wow, there might be side effects." It's how fast can I get this treatment in my body, and will it work? Right. And so there is great discussion from the oncologist and the oncology team about side effects. And I had a whole uh, separate group that I went to to talk to about side effects. But to be honest with you, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't really understand the magnitude of the potential until it started happening to me. Um, because again, um, my disease is spreading. There's a treatment for it that might work. Uh, let's, let's do it. it. And, and if, if I, I have, have a rash, rash I'm, I'm good. good. Let's, let's go. go. And, and if, if I throw, I throw up, up, hey, I'm, I'm good. good. Let's, let's go. go. Fast, Fast forward then, treatment starts, starts and, and your, your body, body just, just, in my case, I had over 30 different types of uh, uh, adverse side effects from the multiple different kinds of treatments. Your body starts feeling differently and you're not sure, is it the treatment? Is it the disease? What's going on? And the great advice I got from uh, my oncologist was, 
Um, she wanted to know absolutely everything new or different that was happening to me. And she wanted to know about it immediately. So, uh, and she didn't just tell me, she told my wife and my kids the same thing because she, she knew that if she just told me, I might, you know, I might not take it as serious or I might want to kind of tough it through. And so I am a huge, huge fan, fan of, of any, any kind, kind of journaling or, or online tool um, that, that goes, goes right into the medical, medical community, community, your care, care provider. provider. Um, I didn't, didn't have that. that. I, I had, had direct, direct access via text and emails. emails. Um, and um, it, it is life-saving. And let me a ask you, if I may, you know, reporting anything new and different, how do you do that on Christmas Eve or on a weekend? Were you, did, were you hesitating that you were kind of, quote unquote, bothering somebody? Sure. Yeah, initially. Um, but one, again, this comes back to your support team. My wife knew that something new and different was happening. My kids would find out about it. And very quickly, the questions would come from all of them. Did you talk to your doc doctor such and such? Did yeah. you let the team know? Mm -hmm. And we did have things happen on holidays. We did have things happen to me on weekends. And I'll tell you, I, I got to the point where I no longer felt I was imposing. Uh, I no longer felt guilty that maybe they had to answer a phone on a weekend or holiday um, because of their insistence, my care provider's insistence, that they wanted to know. There's no waste of time in letting you know. That's right. Early reporting, you know, these direct to chart messaging systems, these online platforms, incredibly important. There is no bothering your oncologist on a holiday or weekend. That's not a, even a thing that goes through our mind. We love and support you and we want to know as soon as possible. So and, you know, we also do self-care. So we're not on call 365 days a year. We have a partner that, that will field the call and then they can manage and help discuss it. But with these side effects, Dr. Cohen, I wonder what you think. You know, is there a is there a mentality that patients should just suck it up and get through the side effects? Or is there actually something that they can do to help control or uh, ameliorate the side effects? Um, well, there may be that attitude that, you know, this, this is expected and so just grin and bear it kind of thing, but um, there are so many things that can be done uh, to help manage side effects. Now, some of them um, are unavoidable. One that, that I had very early on uh, was the uh, endocrine-related side effects to immunotherapy and I don't think there's anything you can do, and, and the only consolation for for people out there uh, with melanoma and getting immunotherapy, as you may know, that uh, adverse events, um, depending on on the severity, are actually a positive prognostic indicator. So that means your body is mounting the immune response, and there's evidence to show that uh, adverse events certainly don't interfere with. Uh, the, the benefits of treatment and may predict better outcomes. That's not to say you don't have great outcomes with, with no adverse events either. Uh, but there's this, this fine balance between creating the right amount of immune response and not too much. And if it's too much of an immune response, that's, that's what, what is happening with these uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor adverse events. Now, you know, you heard from uh, from Dr. Van is about cognitive behavioral therapy and some of these these other strategies. There's also, uh, of course, one of the the go to gold standards for cancer related fatigue, whether it's immunotherapy or otherwise, is is exercise. And I, though it may sound somewhat counterintuitive, um, I, I hadn't actually, of course, experienced cancer related fatigue. Uh, until after about my third course of, of Ipinivo Combo. And I got home one day and was just walking up the driveway. And, and I, the best metaphor is it felt like my feet were in cement blocks. Uh, and, and I could barely put one foot in front of the other. And, you know, I was processing this and said, wow, 
this is cancer related fatigue. I had no idea how debilitating this was. And, you know, uh, the light bulb went off and I said, I know the evidence of what I'm supposed to do. And all I want to do is flop on the couch. But, you know, I, I caught our dog and the leash and, you know, started, you know, plodding my way as best I could uh, around the block and halfway around the block. It, the fatigue kind of started melting away. Now, would it have otherwise if I had just walked on the couch? Uh, maybe. Uh, but the evidence is overwhelming that exercise uh, is, is a good way to combat cancer-related fatigue. Um, some of the skin reactions that are really common, it, it's hard to know whether there's something behavioral. For sure, some of the inflammatory-related issues uh, that happen in the gut due to an excessive immune response, which unfortunately leads to ulcerative colitis in a lot of people on uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. We, we believe the diet will play a role and the microbiome, but the evidence is, is still pending. But, but people who have a more diverse microbiome, and the best way to achieve this is through eating um, soluble fiber-based foods, which is essentially a primarily whole food plant-based diet, um, will have less adverse events. And, and this is turning out to be true for conventional chemotherapies as, as well as immunotherapies. Um, and just lastly, a note about uh, mucositis. So again, one of these shockers that I experienced when I got on the other side of the exam table was just this horrendous mucositis that just blasted out of nowhere. Um, and uh, from, from uh, Ayurvedic medicine in, in particular, it's, it's quite well known that cloves are a, a numbing substance. So cloves, literally the, uh, the um, uh, seed slash spice that, that is used in, uh, in, in many warm beverages and Indian-based cooking. So making a, uh, a, a tea uh, that is, is very strong with cloves and not necessarily swallowing uh, the tea, although you can, um, is, is something that can be quite useful. Of course, it's not going to treat, but it's going to help decrease the amount of pain. And at least, you know, drinking a... Uh, what one could call an anti-inflammatory tea, cloves, cardamom, cinnamon, some of these other spices that we know decrease inflammation. Uh, drinking something like that and, and exposing the, the mucous membranes to that, uh, you know, in, in the time before trying to eat, because of course severe mucositis means uh, eating is excruciatingly painful, um, can be helpful to take the edge off. But circling back to the start of this conversation, it is, it is critical. And of course, being at MD Anderson and a faculty member, it never would even cross my mind to not share an adverse event, regardless of the time of day, um, the, the day of the month, uh, or from, from my perspective, whether, whether I think it is uh, not that big a deal. Um, you know, we need to rely on the medical experts to say, is this something that one, we can do something about, or uh, would, it, would it be something that, that uh, you know, just needs to be known? So it's, it's, it's critical to have that, that open communication, again, because there's so much uh, that we can do. And I didn't even get into all the integrative medicine things like acupuncture and massage and yoga, meditation. Uh, the list is very long, so please, please avail yourselves uh, of, of all these types of services. Yeah, you know, I'll say from a provider's perspective, we also have to do better about asking some of these side effects. There's a very colloquial thing that can happen between a patient and their provider where the question is asked, how are you? How are you feeling? And the very polite human nature response is to say, I feel okay, I'm fine, you know. But that's not really a, a deductive question when trying to get to the bottom of somebody's oncology side effects. And I think, you know, you both explained it very well. I think the questions are better phrased, 
do you have the same amount of energy today that you had before your cancer diagnosis? Can you do the same things that you enjoy doing now that you did before? Are you eating the same? Is your appetite the same? You know, I, I think we often ask um, questions that are not specific enough, and then we get some not specific answers back. It, it is crucial really to report as specifically as early as possible. And as Dr. Cohen mentioned, you know, let's not write off some of these integrative or alternative approaches that your provider team may be able to connect you with. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Cohen really about this idea of diet. If you're a cancer survivor, you've been newly diagnosed, perhaps you're on treatment, or perhaps this diagnosis really is in your rearview mirror, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, about diets. Is ketogenic diet the best? Is a paleo diet the best? Should we cut out all sugar? Some melanoma websites talk about the Gerson diet. What is your take on diet and cancer survivorship? Well, it, it, it's probably the most confusing area um, and, and just before this meeting, I attended a uh, Society for Integrative Oncology webinar on, on uh, fasting diets and, 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 and fasting mimicking diets, which, which sounds a bit crazy too. Um, I think, you know, you, you can boil it down to Michael Pollan actually said it very well, which is, uh, you know, uh, to, to eat uh, whole food uh, not too much and mostly plants. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to be vegan or, or even necessarily vegetarian, but, but the, again, the data is overwhelming about the microbiome and, and that is about having uh, fiber in your diet. And again, healthy fibers are coming from uh, plant-based foods. So can you eat red meat? Well, you know, red meat and colon cancer, the data is, is, is pretty clear, not, not a, a, a good story. Uh, red meat and melanoma, well, there's, there's not a lot of uh, evidence for that direct link. Uh, but there are healthier sources of uh, animal protein as well as uh, healthy sources of protein that come from the plant world, nuts, beans, legumes, uh, etc. So, you know, a key is going to be variety. Uh, a key is going to be whole food. That means minimally processed food. So there's a paper that came out just uh, two weeks ago showing that, that actually even highly processed or what are called ultra processed healthy foods uh, actually are not so healthy for you. Um, and so, you know, eating, eating foods in, in some sense in their original form is going to be most important. And then lastly, uh, being, and, and it comes back to the concept of processed foods, trying to maintain a, a, a balanced or level glycemic load. Um, and, and what that means is that you don't want to have these big spikes in, in glucose. And of course, that happens primarily from if, if you consume a lot of uh, products that have added sugars or that are highly refined because the body is processing uh, and extracting the glucose very rapidly. And then that leads to increases in insulin and insulin related growth factor, all uh, inflammatory factors. Um, and, and this is, you know, is what one term for this type of diet is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and the evidence is, is pretty overwhelming, but it's not just Mediterranean, the Asiatic diet, the South American diet, these, these diets that are, are what we could see as, as more uh, indigenous, let's say, ancient diets before we in food science uh, created all these complexities of uh, what what diet should really look like. So I think, uh, you know, for the audience, the key is it's it's really that Michael Pollan quote, right? Eat real food and not a lot of it. And, you know, we, the takeaway that we're learning, at least in the melanoma sphere, is high fiber promotes a diverse intestinal microbiome to break down these prebiotic sources of food into short chain fatty acids, which are then interplayed with your potential immunotherapy or your mucosal immunity. So what does that mean? That means probably 
paleo diets, ketogenic Atkins are that are reducing your fiber content, reducing your carbohydrate content may be counterintuitive to a melanoma survivor. And what does high fiber look like? We're often thinking of 40, 45 gra uh, grams or more of fiber per day. And you're looking for really those complex carbohydrates. So I challenge the audience members to really, you know, look at their foods and try to calculate how many grams of fiber they're getting uh, per day. It's, it's difficult the way we eat in the Western world to do that but quite possible. I'd like to hear from Mr. Tolley if he uh, changed his diet at all during his cancer journey, if, if you could briefly weigh in. And then a question for Dr. Yanez, what happens when people are interested in these maneuvers and they don't have access to it, right? They're at a small community facility. How do they tap into perhaps supportive oncology, integrative oncology, or some of these resources? Let's start with Mr. Tolley and see, see what he did with his diet during his journey. Yeah, so um, when I was uh, the sickest, I was uh, least um, likely to eat, right? I mean, you just don't feel like eating. And um, during one of the infusions I had, uh, we connected with a nutritious, a nutritionist, excuse me, who specializes in with working with oncology patients. patients. And, and she, she shared a lot of what Dr. Dr. Cohen had, had just articulated. articulated. And, um, so, so we, you know, we, one, one of the, the things, things in addition to that, that she talked about was protein intake. And, um, that began for me, uh, really, uh, an awareness of the importance of protein. I already had an awareness of the importance of fiber, but the importance of, uh, protein. So I upped the level of protein, plant-based proteins through smoothies and things like that along with upping the level of fiber um, and uh, found that it was very helpful, very helpful. That's great. I know we're running a little short on time. So Dr. Yanez, why don't you tell us about access to these oncology, specialty oncology services? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Patel. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, cancer centers vary in the resources that they have and the programs that they have. Um, for, for patients who don't have maybe an in-house supportive oncology program, um, they can try accessing uh, local resources that are within their city or town, but maybe outside of their cancer center, such as Gilda's Club or Immerman Angels. Um, they are national organizations that will provide support groups for patients. Um, some of them do like art therapy, music therapy, um, different types of support groups for different, uh, some of them will be like breast cancer support groups, prostate cancer. Um, so you can see if there's also a support group for melanoma or just general uh, type of support group for cancer patients. They also run support groups for caregivers. That's a good way to connect with other patients. I like the organization Immerman Imr Angels. You can go online and you, you know they will actually match you with another cancer mentor anywhere in the country. So that's kind of a way to talk to somebody else and get a little bit more information um, if your particular cancer center doesn't offer that. Um, most cities and towns will also have psychologists who do specialize in oncology. So a lot of our psychologists and psychiatrists within our cancer center also have private practices outside of our cancer center. So they see patients elsewhere. So you might want to ask your oncologist or a nurse practitioner in your oncologist's office if they have a list of referrals for psychologists or psychiatrists that have worked with their patients in the past. So there, there could be ways to get access to these resources outside of your cancer center. Just I was asking around or maybe type of support groups outside the cancer center. Yeah, that's great. And perhaps just in closing, uh, you know, in preparation for Dr. Leachman, who's coming up to talk about certainly primary uh, protection, um, I'm wondering, Dr. Cohen, if you have any thoughts about uh, environmental exposure, sunscreen use. Uh, does a melanoma patient need to worry about getting a second melanoma? Do, can they throw the sunscreen away? What are your thoughts about? Uh, kind of secondary prevention of primary malignancies. Yeah, well, I'm not sure where the where, how strong the data is on a second primary melanoma due to something, for example, that we do when we're 50, 60, or 70. I think you know, with with a lot of these uh, cancers and melanoma being one of them, kidney cancer, even breast cancer, a, a lot of the the original mutations 
uh, happened many years earlier. Uh, there's some suggestion with, with kidney cancer that that first mutation that ultimately led to the clinical diagnosis could have happened 50 years before the clinical presentation. Um, and so I think the same is true for melanoma. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that we should not be protecting our, our skin. And, and my wife and, and co-author of the book Anti-Cancer Living you know, puts it in, in, in this frame, which is that, you know, to the degree that you can take any pressure off of your body in managing any, any negative exogenous types of, of toxins, whether, you know, so our body is well equipped to, to take care of a lot of these toxins and exposures, but it takes work. It'll take work on your liver. It'll take work on, on your kidney. It's going to take work, you know, if you're getting excess radiation, sun exposure on your skin. You know, a lot of the processes to, to fix that burn uh, are, are going to that area of your body. Um, and so, you know, we want to keep all parts of our body as inhospitable to cancer as, as possible. So that means uh, being as, as healthy as possible inside, outside, and, and you know, decreasing uh, exposures as much as possible. That's great. I am so grateful to all of our panelists in this lively discussion that we had today. You know, I'd just like to summarize it. a couple of things that we really touched on today. You know, reporting side effects when you're a cancer survivor on treatment and even after treatment. There can be long lasting effects in anything that has nothing to do with your treatment. We certainly want to hear about it. So using these newer reporting tools to get that information to your provider is important. Naming your emotions, naming and sharing is a very powerful tool um, to work on amygdala, you know, stress and I think we're just thriving as a survivor. And that's sleeping. We didn't get to talk about sleep hygiene and meditation and what that really looks like. Spiritual my feet is part of my You know, I think all of these are for your uh, survivorship, your caretaker survivorship, and, and perhaps even your provider. Thank you to the Research Alliance and to our panelists in the audience.